Hello and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I am Alicia, your host, and today we are going to do a tutorial of Rachmaninoff's Prelude Opus 3 Number 2 in C Sharp Minor. Now, I want to make a note though, this isn't the like full real version of this prelude. This is a simplified tutorial. And I've done a few of these on this channel before, but it's been a long time since I've done one, so I thought Rachmaninoff would be a good way to uh, a good one to explore because his music is so difficult that you have to play piano for most of us have to play for years and years before ever getting to them but sometimes it's fun to explore more difficult pieces at an earlier level so this is about an early intermediate level um version of the prelude that i've edited and simplified so yeah let's get started <laughs> As we discussed in the last video, the um, or two videos ago, I guess, Music of Rachmaninoff, this prelude is one of his most famous compositions. It's found in a set of five piano pieces, more code to fantasy, and it's one of the 24 preludes he wrote for the piano in every single major and minor key. This specific prelude has the nickname The Bells of Moscow because of the bell-like chordal first part, which is what we're going to be working on in today's tutorial. It was written when Rachmaninoff was just 19 years old, and it became so popular in his lifetime that when he would have a performance, the audience would chant C sharp, C sharp, because they wanted to hear it as an encore. And like Radiohead with Creep, Rachmaninoff rude the day that he ever wrote this prelude because it became so popular and he just got really sick of playing it. With that being said, let's hop to the keyboard and play it. With tutorials, I always like to start by looking at the basics. So first of all, what key is this prelude in? Since we have four sharps, that's, well, there's a lot to keep track of. The major key with four sharps is E, and the minor key with four sharps is C sharp. So in order to figure out which one this is in, we usually take a look at the beginning. I'm just going to ignore the intro, because this is kind of where we really start. And this is a C sharp. If we scroll to the end, we'd see it ends on a C sharp. So we are solidly in C sharp minor for this prelude. When learning this piece, you might find it useful to learn the C sharp natural minor scale just to get used to the four sharps. Otherwise, they might come at you a little randomly. So that's your C sharp natural minor scale. It's easy to remember in a way because there's a pair of two here and a pair of two there. So you're basically going two black keys in a row, then two black keys in a row. Um, so yeah, I would... I would learn how to play that scale, and that'll help you out a lot. I would learn this one by starting first with the right hand, getting used to the notes, because there's just a whole ton of accidentals, like naturals and sharps and stuff to keep your eyes on. Once you're confident with that, I would separately work on the upper left hand notes and then put it together. So you'll notice how the left hand is split into two parts. You have the notes that kind of ride with the stems going up over here, and then we have the notes on the lower half. Um, What's tricky about this is your left hand's going to be bouncing around. It's going to be going from a low 
to a high note, from a low to a high note, and so on and so forth. The notes in the upper line are quite tricky. You're going to have to be reading, in some cases, quite a few ledger lines. So what I do in this instance is I actually, like, on my own music, I would write in the letter for a few of these just to make life a little easier because ain't nobody got time to read all those ledger lines. There's also something we haven't talked about on this channel before, and that is the double sharp. Double sharps look like an X and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a note that's sharped twice. So here we have an F double sharp, which is technically a G on the keyboard. Um, there's a whole lot of, like there's music theory reasons for that, but we're, we're not gonna get into that today. Just know that if you see an F double sharp, you play a G. Once you can play the right hand notes and you can play the upper left hand notes, which would be over here, and then you can play them together. Let me play them right. Erase, start from where I said, and then you can play them together. Once you can do that with the whole piece, that's when I would then go in and add those lower bass notes to the whole process. I might start by bridging these low bass note jumps with the lower left hand part and get used to reaching across the keyboard. Now these are huge jumps, which are tough, but again, since you are um, going so slowly that gives you time to think about making those leaps and you can do nice arcs with your hand. Once you got that, then you can put all three parts to, together. And so on. There are lots of details to pay attention to in this one. So first of all, the melody is accented with a constant array of tenudos, which basically just means to hold the notes for their full value. It's almost like an accent. You, you really want to dig into those notes and let them ring before you move on to the next one. This works because you're also playing really, really slow, which is what lento means. Next, we have some two note slurs. And a little further on, here we have a breath mark. There's a few of these breath marks in the piece. If you were singing this melody, this little apostrophe breath mark would be your symbol to take a breath, to breathe. So we can do that on the piano by just creating a little lift of the hand, a little bit of an air pocket in the sound. Now, as far as playing the two note slurs, they have a, a leaning feel to them. The first note leans into the next note, almost like a sigh. When my students play two note slurs on the piano, I get them to think of the word sighing because that's how you wanna play them. So, sighing, sighing, sighing. So the first one has a little more oomph than the second one. So it's a little heavy light. Down, up, down, up. And you notice my wrist is kind of making this down, up, down, up motion. Just because that first note should have just a little more weight in it. Anyway, I could ramble about this. I've actually done an entire video on two note slurs. So check that out if you want more information. Now I am adding pedal into this piece and I don't want to get into too much of a discussion about that today, but I do lightly pedal with the syncopated pedal technique that I've talked about extensively in a couple videos. So basically whenever the harmony changes, I'm lifting my foot. So that's two or three times a bar. So usually what I'll do is I will hold and hold through each bass note and then do a little lift every time the bass note changes. So I'm gonna press here. Oh, that was really loud. <laughs> that was too quiet. And lift, and lift, and lift. So I refresh it with every bass note change basically. I already hinted that at this already, but by far the biggest challenge of this piece is that leaping left hand. It's constantly leaping octaves and bigger. So this is a really good study piece for keyboard geography, especially being able to play with minimal staring at your hand. Um, usually when I'm doing jumps like this, I try to train myself to at most take a quick little glance while I'm doing those leaps instead of watching my left hand like a hawk. Um, but yeah, since it's a slow piece, you have lots of time and space to do these jumps. Some of the left hand notes are marked with a staccato. So your low left hand notes right here. Now, when you're playing staccato this slowly, it's not gonna be like 
a really intense staccato like in mm -hmm. faster pieces you really i think a staccato means to hold it for like a quarter of the duration or a half i can't actually remember off the top of my head but i do really relaxed staccatos and of course the staccato sound is dampened when you're using the damper pedal. The dynamic markings in this piece are pretty sparse, but super dramatic. So we start with fortissimo and then immediately go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum, pianissimo, I think is how you'd actually say that one. Because there are so few dynamic markings, I like to go in and fill in the blanks a little bit. So I think it sounds nice to have a crescendo leading into this mezzo forte and then coming back down as the notes descend, we also can come down in the volume back to our pianissimo. I hope, I really hope I'm saying that right. It's not, not a word you have to say very often. Um, but feel free to fill in the gaps a little bit because when you hit that super quiet section near the end, there's no other dynamic markings, but there's a lot of potential to have movement within within that. So just play around with it and find what feels right. And that is all for today's video. I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the video, but if you hop on over to the blog post that goes along with this, you can find it in the description bar. Um, you'll be able to get the PDF printout of this for free, um, just for fun and to play along with. So definitely go check that out. Thank you so much for watching this video. You can give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hang out with me over on social and Patreon, and I'll catch you next time. So let's take a look here and there go away windows pop up. Ugh. Ah! Ugh. We're just going to try this again. That was a hot mess. Whoa. <laughs>